All right. Golden Compass, Chapter 10, The Council and the Bear. In this chapter, everybody, I'm going to be highlighting words that are of interest that we don't know or may not know. I'm also going to be highlighting um, characterization because if you're watching this, you should be paying attention to characterization of certain characters. John Fa and the other leaders had decided that they would make for Trollsound, Tr uh, the main port of Lapland. The witches had a cons consulate in the town, and John Fa knew that without their help, or at least their friendly neutrality, it would be impossible to rescue the captive children. He explained his idea to Lyra and Farter Corum the next day, when Lyra's seasickness had abated slightly. The sun was shining brightly, and the green waves were dashing against the bows, bearing white streams of foam as they curved away. Out on the deck, with the breeze blowing and the whole sea a sparkle with light and movement, she felt little sickness at all. And now that Pantalaemon had discovered the delights of being a seagull and then a stormy petrel and skimmering and skimming the wave tops, Lyra was too absorbed by his glee to wallow in landlubberly misery. John Fa Farter Quorum and two or three others sat in the stern of the ship with the sun full on them talking about what to do next. Now Farter Quorum knows these Lapland witches, John Fa said, and if I ain't mistaken, there's an obligation there. That's right, John, said Farter Quorum. It were forty years back, but that's nothing to a witch. Some of them live to many times that. What happened to bring this obligation about, Farter Quorum, said Adam Stefanski, the man in charge of the fighting troop. I saved the witch's life, Farter Quorum explained. She fell out of the air, being pursued by a great red bird like to nothing I'd seen before. She fell injured in the marsh, and I set out to find her. She was like to drowning, and I got her on board and shot that bird down, and it fell into a bog. To my regret, for it was as big as a bittern and flame red. Ah, the other men murmured, captured by Farter Quorum's story. Now when I got her in the boat, he went on, I had the most grim shock I'd ever known because that young woman had no demon. It was if he'd said she had no head. The very thought was repugnant. The men shuddered. Their demons bristled or shook themselves or called harshly, and the men soothed them. Pantalaemon crept into Lyra's arms, their hearts beating together. So it's shocking to these people that somebody might not have a demon. At least Farter Corman said that's what it seemed, being as she fell out of the air, I more than suspected she was a witch. She looked exactly like a young woman, thinner than some and prettier than most. But not seeing that demon gave me a hideous turn. Ain't they got demons then, the witches, said the other man, Michael Kinzona? Their demon is demons is invisible, I expect, said Adam Savansky. He was there all the time, and Farter Quorum never saw him. No, you're wrong, Adam, said Farter Quorum. He weren't there at all. The witches have the power to separate themselves from their demons, a mighty sight further in what we can. If need be, they can send their demons far abroad, on the wind or the clouds, or down below the ocean. And this witch, I found, she hadn't been resting above an hour when their demon came a-flying back because he'd felt her fear and their, her injury, of course. And it's my belief, though she never admitted to this, that the great red bird I shot was another witch's demon in pursuit. Lord, that made me shiver. When I thought of that, I'd have stayed my hand if I'd have taken any measures on sea or land, but there it was. Anyway, there was no doubt I saved her life, and she gave me a token of it and said I was to call on her help if ever it was needed. And once she sent me help when this scraling shot me with a poison arrow... We had other connections, too. I haven't seen her from that day to this, but she'll remember. And does she live in uh, Cholsons, this witch? No, no. They live in forests and on the tundra, not in a seaboard among men and women. Their business is with the wild, but they keep a council there, and I shall get word to her. Make no doubt about that. Lyra was keen to know more about the witches, but the men had turned their talk to the matter of fuel and stores, and presently she grew impatient to see the rest of the ship. She wandered along the deck towards the bows and soon made the acquaintance 
of an able seaman by flicking at him the pips she'd saved from the apple she'd eaten at breakfast. She was, he was a stout and placid man, and when he'd sworn at her and been sworn at in return, they became great friends. He was called Jerry. Under his guidance, she found out that having something to do prevented you from feeling sick, and that even a job like scrubbing a deck could be satisfying if it was done in a seaman-like way. She was very taken with this notion, and later on, she folded the blankets on her bunk in a seaman-like way and put her possessions in the closet in a seaman-like way and used stow instead of tidy for the process of doing so. After two days at sea, Lear decided that this was the life for her. She had the run of the ship from the engine room to the bridge, and she was soon on first-name terms with all the crew. Captain Rokeby let her signal to a Holland's frigate by pulling the handle of the steam whistle. The cook suffered her, her help in mixing plum duff, and only a stern word from John Fa prevented her from climbing the foremast to inspect the horizon from the crow's nest, which is like a lookout spot. So she gets to know the ship really well. All the time they were steaming north, moving north, and it grew colder daily. The ship's stores were searched for oil skins that could be cut down for her, and Jerry showed her how to sew, an art she learned willingly from him, though she had scorned it at Jordan and avoided instruction from Mrs. Lonsdale. Together they made a waterproof bag for the owl thermometer that she could wear around her waist, in case she fell in the sea, she said. With it safely in place, she clung to the rail in her oilskins, and southwester at the stinking spray broke over the bows and surged along the deck. She still felt seasick occasionally, especially when the wind got up and the ship plunged heavily over the crest of the gray-green waves, and then it was Pantalaemon's job to distract her from it by skimming the waves as a stormy petrel. Petrel. Because she could feel his boundless glee in the dash of wind and water and forgot her nausea. From time to time, he even tried being a fish and once joined a school of dolphins to their surprise and pleasure. Lyra stood shivering in the fossicle and laughed with delight as her beloved pantalaemon, sleek and powerful, leaped from the water with half a dozen other swift gray shapes. He had to stay close to the ship, of course, where he could never go to f go far from her. But she sensed his desire to speed as far and as fast as he could for pure exhilaration. She shared his pleasures, but for her, it wasn't simple pleasure, for there was pain and fear in it too. Suppose he loved being a dolphin more than he loved being with her on land. What would she do then? Her friend, the able seaman, was nearby, and he paused as he adjusted the canvas cover of the forward hatch to look out at the little girl's demon skimming and leaping with the dolphins. His own demon, a seagull, had her head tucked under her wing on the capstan. He knew what Lyra was feeling. I remember when I first went to sea, my Belisaria, Belisaria hadn't settled on one form. I was that young, and she loved being a poor poise. So remember, guys, when you're young in this world, your demon can change any animal. It becomes... It's official animal when you um, become an adult. I was afraid she settled like that. There was one old sailor man on my first vessel who could never go ashore at all because his demon had settled as a dolphin and he could never leave the water. He was a wonderful sailor, but best navigator you ever knew. Could have made a fortune at the fishing, but he wasn't happy at it. He was never quite happy till he died and he could be buried at sea. Why do demons have to settle, Lyra said. I want Pantalaemon to be able to change forever, so does he. Ah, uh, they always have settled, and they always will. That's part of growing up. There'll come a time when you'll be tired of his changing about, and you'll want a settled kind of form for him. I never will. Oh, you will. You'll want to grow up like all the other girls. Anyway, there's compensations for a settled form. What are they? Knowing what kind of person you are. Take old Belisaria. She's a seagull, and that means I'm a kind of seagull, too. I'm not grand and splendid nor beautiful, but I'm a tough old thing, and I can survive anywhere and I'll always find a bit of food and company. That's worth knowing, that is. And when your demon settles, you'll know the sort of person you are. But suppose your demon settles in a shape you don't like. Well, then you're discontented, ain't you? That's, there's plenty of folk as like to have a lion as a demon and then end up with a poodle. Until they learn to be satisfied with what they are, they're going to be fretful about it. 
waste of feeling, that is, but it didn't seem to Lyra that she would ever grow up. One morning, there was a different smell in the air, and the ship was moving oddly, with a brisker rocking from side to side instead of the plunging and soaring. Lyra was on deck a minute after she woke up, gazing greedily at the land. Such a strange sight after all the water, for though they had only been at sea a few days, Lyra felt as if they'd been on the ocean for months. Directly ahead of the ship, a mountain rose, green flanked and snow-capped, and a little town and harbor lay below it. Wooden houses with steep roofs and oratory spire, cranes in the harbor, and clouds of gulls wheeling and crying. The smell was of fish, but mixed with it came land smells too. Pine resin and earth and something animal and musky, and something else that was cold and blank and wild. It might have been snow. It was the smell of the north. Seals frisked about around the ship, showing their clown faces above the water before sinking back without a splash. The wind that lifted spray off the white cap waves was monstrously cold and searched out every gap in Lyra's wolf skin, and her hands were soon aching and her face numb. Pantalaemon, in his ermine shape, warmed her neck for her, but it was too cold to stay outside for long without work to do, even to watch the seals, and Lyra went below to eat her breakfast porridge and looked through the porthole in the saloon. Inside the harbor, the water was calm, and as they moved past the massive breakwater, Lyra began to feel unsteady from the lack of motion. She and Pantalaemon avidly watched as the ship inched ponderously towards the quayside. During the next hour, the sound of the engine died away to a quiet background rumble. Voices shouted orders or queries. Ropes were thrown on gangways lowered hatches opened come on lyra said farter quorum is everything packed lyra's possessions such as they were had been packed ever since she'd woken up and seen the lands all she had to do was run to the cabin and pick up the shopping bag and she was ready the first thing she and farter quorum did ashore was to visit the house of the witch council it didn't take long to find it the little town was clustered around the harbor with the oratory and the governor's house the only buildings of any size. The witch council lived in a green painted wooden house with sight of the sea within sight of the sea, and when they rang the bell it jangled loudly in the quiet street. A servant showed them into a little parlor and brought them coffee. Presently the council himself came in to greet them. He was a fat man with a florid face and a sober black suit, whose name was Martin Lanzulus. His demon was a little serpent, the same intense and brilliant green as his eyes, which were the only witch-like things about him. The Lyra was not sure what they, what she had been expecting a witch to look like. How can I help you, Farter Quorum? He said. In two ways, Doctor Lanzulus. First, I'm anxious to get in touch with a witch lady I met some years ago in the Fen country of Eastern Anglia. Her name is Serafina Pecola. Dr. Lanzilis made a note with a silver pencil. How long ago was your meeting with her, he said. Must be 40 years, I, but I think she would remember. And what is the second way in which you seek my help? I'm representing a number of Egyptian families who've lost children. We've got reason to believe there's an organization capturing these children, ours and others, and bringing them to the north for some unknown purpose. I'd like to know whether you or your people have heard of anything like this going on. Dr. Lancelis sips his coffee blandly. It's not impossible that it's not impossible that notice of some such activity might have come our way, he said. You realize the relationships between my people and the Northlanders are perfectly cordial. Perfectly good. It would be difficult for me to justify disturbing them. Farter Quorum nodded as if he understood very well. To be sure, he said and it wouldn't be necessary for me to ask you if I could get the information any other way. That was why I asked about the witch lady first. Now Dr. Lansley has nodded as if he understood. Lyra watched this game with puzzlement and respect. There were all kinds of things going on beneath it, and she saw that the witch council was coming to a decision. Very well, he said. Of course, that's true, and you'll realize that your name is not unknown to us, Farter Quorum. Serafina Pecola is queen of a witch clan in the region of Lake Anera. As for your, your other question, it is of course understood that this information is not reaching you through me. Quite so. 
Well, in this very town, there is a branch of an organization called the Northern Progress Exploration Company, which pretends to be searching for minerals, but which is really controlled by something called the General Ablation Board of London. This organization, I happen to know, imports children. This is not generally known in the town. The Norway government is not officially aware of it. The children don't remain here long. They are taken some distance inland. So, guys, if you're confused about what just happened here... The council was like, oh, I can't say anything. And Farter Quorum was kind of saying, I can go other... I'm going to get this information no matter what, so you might as well tell me. So they had a little silent like um, chess game, as Lyra pointed out. And if you're looking for characterization, you could look here. Um, Lyra watched the game with puzzlement and respect. So you could call her observant here. That's a characterization of Lyra. She's observant. But Farter Quorum just found out that the town they're in is relation to the General Ovation Board. This is where children are being uh, funneled through. Do you know where, Dr. Lanslius? No, I would tell you if I did. And do you know what happens to them there? For the first time, Dr. Lanslius glanced at Lyra. She looked stolidly back. The little green serpent demon raised her head from the council's collar and whispered tongue flickeringly, flickeringly in his ear. The council said, I have heard the phrase, the Maystad process, in connection with this matter. I think they use that in order to avoid calling what they do it by a proper name. I have also heard the word intercision, but what it refers to, I could not say. And are they any children in the town at the moment, said Farter Quorum. He was stroking his demon's fur as she sat alert in his lap. Lyra noticed that she had stopped purring. So again, Lyra is observant here. No, I think not, said Dr. Lanslius. A group of about 12 arrived a week ago and moved out the day before yesterday. Ah, as a recent as that, then that gives us a bit of hope. How did they travel, Dr. Lanslius? By sledge. And you have no idea where they went? Very little. It is not a subject we are interested in. Quite so. Now you've answered all my questions very fairly, sir. And here's just one more. If you were me, what question would you ask of the Council of the Witches? For the first time, Dr. Lansley smiled. I would ask where I could obtain the services of an armored bear, he said. Lyra sat up and felt Pantalaemon's heart leap in her hands. I understand the armored bear is to be in the service of the Ablation Board, said Farter Quorum in surprise. I mean, the Northern Progress Company or whatever they're calling themselves. There is at least one who is not. You will find him at the Sledge Depot at the end of Langlacur Street. He earns a living there at the moment, but such as his temper and the fear he engenders and the dogs, his employment might not last for long. Is he a renegade, then? It seems so. His name is... Iorek Berenson. Bernison. You asked what I would ask, and I told you. Now, here is what I would do. I would seize the chance to employ an armored bear, even if it were far more remote than this. Lyra could hardly sit still. Farter Quorum, however, knew the etiquette, the manners for meeting such as this, and took another spiced honey cake from the plate. While he ate it, Dr. Lanzelis turned to Lyra. So here's a characterization for... Farter Quorum. He's respectful and courteous. He knows proper manners. I understand that you are in possession of an owl thermometer, he said to her great surprise, for how could he have known that? Yes, she said, and then prompted by a nip from Pantalame and added, Would you like to look at it? This is her being polite. This is Lyra being polite. That's a characterization. I should like that very much. She fished elegantly in the oilskin pouch and handed him the velvet package. He unfolded it and held it up with great care, gazing at the face like a scholar gazing at a rare manuscript. How exquisite, he said. I have seen one other example, but it was not so fine as this. And do you possess the books of readings? No, Lyra began, but before she could say any more, Farter Quorum was speaking. No, the great pity is that although Lyra possesses the owl thermometer itself, there's no means of reading it whatsoever, he said. It's just as much of a mystery as the pools of ink and Hindus, the Hindus use for reading the future. And the nearest book of readings I know of is in the Abbey of St. Johann at Heidelberg. Lyra could see why he was saying this. He didn't want Dr. Lanslius to know of Lyra's power, but she could 
also see something Father Corum couldn't, which was the agitation of Dr. Langelis' demon, and she knew at once that it was no good to pretend. Again, this is Lyra being very observant, very intelligent. She's being empathetic here. This is a great description to use in your worksheet. So she said, actually, I can read it, speaking half to Dr. Lansley and half to Farter Quorum, and it was the consul who responded. That is wise of you, he said. Where did you obtain this one? The master of Jordan College in Oxford gave it to me, she said. Dr. Lansley, do you know who made them? They are said to originate in the city of Prague, said the consul. The scholar who invented the first alphamometer was apparently trying to discover a way of measuring the influences of the planets according to the ideas of astrology. He intended to make a device that would respond to the ideas of Mars or Venus as a compass responds to the ideas of North. In that he failed, but the mechanism he invented was clearly responding to something even if no one knew what it was. And where did they get the symbols from? Oh, this was in the 17th century. Symbols and emblems were everywhere. Buildings and pictures were designed to be read like books. Everything stood for something else. If you had the right dictionary, you could read nature itself. It was hardly surprising to find philosophers using the symbolism of their time to interpret knowledge that came from a mysterious source. But, you know, they haven't been used for seriously for two centuries or so. He handed the instrument back to Lyra and added, May I ask a question? Without the books as symbols, how do you read it? I just make my mind go clear, and then it's sort of like looking down into water. You got to let your eyes find the right level, because that's the only one that's in focus. Something like that, she said. I wonder if I might ask to see you do it, he said. Lear looked at Farter Quorum, wanting to say yes, but waiting for his approval. The old man nodded. What shall I ask, said Lyra. What are the intentions of the Tartars with, with regard to Kamchatka? That wasn't hard. Lyra turned the hands to the camel, which meant Asia, which meant Tartars, to the cornucopia for Kam Kamchatka, where there were gold mines, and to the ant, which meant activity, which meant purpose and intention. Then she sat still, letting her mind hold the level, three levels of meaning together in focus and relax for the answer which came almost at once. The long needle trembled to the, on the dolphin, the helmet, the baby, and the anchor, dancing between them and onto the crucible in a complicated pattern that Lyra's eyes followed without hesitation, but which was incomprehensible to the two men. All right, so right here, Lyra's intelligent, and she's competent. She's very competent in her work, and another characteristic of Lyra. When it had completed the movement several times, Lyra looked up. She blinked once or twice as if she were coming out of a trance. They're going to pretend to attack it, but they're not really going to because it's too far away and they'd be too stretched out, she said. Would you tell me how you read that? The dolphin, one of the deep down meanings, is playing. Sort of like being playful, she explained. I know it's the 15th because it stopped 15 times and it just got clear at that level, but nowhere else. And the helmet means war, and both together they mean pretend to go to war but not be serious. And the baby means it means difficult. It'd be too hard for them to attack it. And the anchor says why? Because they'd be stretched out as tight as an anchor rope. I just see it all like that, you see. Dr. Lanzius nodded. Remarkable, he said. I am very grateful. I shall not forget that. Then he looked strangely at Farter Quorum and back at Lyra. Could I ask you for one more demonstration, he said. If you look out of this window, you'll see a shed with 40 or more sprays of cloud pine hanging on the wall. One of them has been used by Serafina Pecola, and the others have not. Could you tell which is hers? Yeah, said Lyra, always ready to show off, and she looked, took the aisle thermometer and hurried out. She was eager to see cloud pine because the witches used it for flying, and she'd never seen it before, seen any before. The two men stood by the window and watched as she kicked her way through the snow, Pantalaemon bouncing beside her as a hare to stand in front of the wooden shed, head down, manipulating the alphamometer. After a few seconds, she reached forward and unhesitatingly picked out one of the many sprays of pine and held it up. So characteristic for Lyra up here, she's eager, easily excitable. 
Dr. Lansley just nodded. Lyra, intrigued and eager to fly, held it above her head and jumped and ran about in the snow trying to be a witch. The council turned to Farter Quorum and said, Do you realize who this child is? She's the daughter of Lord Azriel, said Farter Quorum, and her mother is Mrs. Kutler of the Oblation Board. And apart from that, the old Egyptian had to shake his head. No, he said, I don't know any more. But she's a strange, innocent creature, and I wouldn't have her harm for the world. How come... How how she comes to read the instrument, I couldn't guess, but I believe her when she talks of it. Why, Dr. Lanzius? What do you know about her? The witches have talked about this child for centuries past, said the council, because they live so close to the place where the veil between the worlds is thin. They hear immortal whispers from time to time and the voices of those beings who pass between the worlds, and they have spoken of a child such as this who has a great destiny that can only be fulfilled some elsewhere, not in this world, but far beyond. Without this child, we shall all die, so the witches say. But she must fulfill this destiny in ignorance of what she is doing, because only in her ignorance can we be saved. Do you understand that, Farter Quorum? No, said Farter Quorum. I'm unable to say that I do. What it means is that she must be free to make mistakes. We must hope that she does not, but we can't guide her. I am glad to have seen this child before I die. But how did you recognize her as being that particular child? And what did you mean about the beings who pass between the worlds? I'm at a loss to understand you, Dr. Lanslius. For all that I judge, you're an honest man. But before the council could answer, the door opened and Lyra came in bearing a little branch of pine. This is the one, she said. I tested them all, and this is it, I'm sure, but it won't fly for me. The council said, well, Lyra, this is remarkable. You are lucky to have an instrument like that, and I wish you well with it. I would like to give you something to take away with you. He took the spray and broke off a twig for her. Did, you, did she really fly with this, Lyra said? Yes, she did, but then she is a witch and you are not. I can't give you all of it because I need to contact her, but this will be enough. Look after it. Yes, I will, she said. Thank you. And she tucked it into her purse besides the owl thermometer. Farter Quorum touched the spray of pine as, it, as if for luck, and on his face was an expression Lyra had never seen before, almost a longing. The council showed them to the door, where he shook hands with Farter Quorum and shook Lyra's hand too. I hope you find success, he said, and stood on the doorstep in the piercing cold to watch them up the little secret. Up the little street. He knew the answer about the Tartars before I did, Lyra told Farter Quorum. The Alphamater told me, but I never said. It was the Trucible. I spe expect he was testing you, child, but you done right to be polite, being as we can't be sure what he knows already. And that was a useful tip about the bear. I don't know how we would have we, we would have heard otherwise. They found their way to the depot which is where the bear is at, which was a couple of concrete warehouses in a scrubby area of waste ground where thin weeds grew between gray rocks and pools of icy mud. A surly man in an office told them that they could find the bear off duty at six, but they'd have to be quick because he usually went straight to the yard behind Einarsen's bar where they could give him a drink, gave him a drink. Then Farter Quorum took Lyra to the best outfitters in town and brought her some proper cold weather clothing. They bought a parka made of reindeer skin because reindeer hair is hollow and insulates well, and the hood was lined with wolverine fur because the sheds because that sheds the ice from form that forms when you breathe. They bought underclothing and boot liners of reindeer calfskin and silk gloves to go inside big fur mittens. The boots and mittens were made of skin from the reindeer forelegs because that is extra tough, and the boots were sold with the skin of the bearded seal, which is as tough as walrus hide, but lighter. Finally, they brought a waterproof cape that enveloped her completely, made of semi-transparent seal intestine. With all that on, and a silk muffler around her neck, and a woolen cap over her ears, and the big hood pulled forward, she was uncomfortably warm, but they were going to much colder regions than this. John Fa had been supervising the unloading of the ship and was keen to hear about the witch's council, council's words, and even keener to learn of the bear. We'll go to him this very evening, he said. Have you ever spoken to such a creature, Farter Quorum? Yes, I have, and fought one too, though not by myself, thank God. We must be ready to treat him Treat with him, John.
I'm so, okay. He'll ask a lot, I've no doubt, and he surely and be surely and difficult to manage when we must have him. Oh, we must, and what of your witch? Well, she's a long way off and a clan queen now, said Farter Quorum. I did hope it might be possible for a message to reach her, but it would take too long to wait for a reply. Ah, well, now let me tell you what I found, old friends. For John Fa had been fidgeting with impatience to tell them something. He had met a prospector on the quayside, a new Dane from the country of Texas, and this man had a balloon, of all things. The expedition he'd been hoping to join had failed for lack of funds even before it had left Amsterdam, so he was stranded. Think what he might do with the help of an aeronaut, Farter Quorum, said John Fa, rubbing his great hands together. I've engaged him to sign up with us. Seems to be we seems to me we struck luck struck lucky at coming here. Luckier still if we had a clear idea of where he was going, said Farter Quorum, but nothing could damp John Fa's pleasure in being on campaign once more. So they're out in the action, John Fa's excited. After darkness had fallen, when and when the stores and equipment had all been safely unloaded and stood in waiting on the quay, Farter Quorum and Lyra walked along the waterfront and looked for Ein Arson's bar, which is where the bear's at. They found it easy enough, a crude concrete shed with red neon sign flashing irregularly over the door and the sound of loud voices through the condensation frosted windows. A pitted alley besides it led to a sheet metal gate into a near rear yard where a lean-to shed stood crazily over a floor of frozen mud. Dim yellow light through the rear window of the bar showed a vast pale form crouching upright and gnawing at a haunch of meat which it held in both hands. Lyra had an impression of blood-stained muzzle and face, small male uh, malevolent black eyes, and an immensely an immensity of dirty matted yellowish fur. As it gnawed, hideous growling, crunching, sucking noises came from it. Farter Quorum stood by the gate and called, Eirik Bernison. The bear stopped eating, and far as they could tell, he was looking at them directly, but it was impossible to read any expression on his face. Eirik Bernison, said Farter Quorum again, may I speak to you? All right, so some characterization on Farter Quorum. He's being polite and courteous. Lyra's heart was thumping hard. So characterization for Lyra. She's nervous. Because something in the bear's presence made her feel close to coldness, danger, brutal power. But a power controlled by intelligence and not a human intelligence. Nothing like a human because, of course, bears had no demons. This strange, hulking presence, gnawing its meat, was like nothing she had ever imagined. And she felt a profound admiration and pity for the lonely creature. He dropped the reindeer leg in the dirt and slumped on all fours to the gate. Then he reared up massively, ten feet or more high, as if to show how mighty he was, to remind them how useless the gate would be as a barrier, and he spoke to them from the height. Well, who are you? His voice was deep. It seemed to shake the earth. The rank smell that came from his body was almost overpowering. I'm Farter Quorum from the Egyptian people of Eastern Anglia, and this little girl is Lyra Balakwa. What do you want? All right, so characterizations of the bear. He's a bit curt. He's a bit rude. We want to offer you employment, Iaric Berenison. I am employed. The bear dropped in all fours again. It was very hard to detect any expressive tones in his voice, whether of irony or anger, because it was so deep and so flat. What do you do at the sledge depot? Farter Quorum asked. I mend broken machinery and articles of iron. I lift heavy objects. What kind of work is that for a pangeborn? Paid work. Behind the bear, the door of the bar opened a little way, and a man put down a large earthenware jar before looking up to peer at them. Who's that, he said. Stranger, said the bear. The bartender looked as if he was going to ask something more, but the bear lurched towards him suddenly, and the man shut the door in alarm. The bear hooked a claw through the handle of the jar and lifted it up to his mouth. Lyra could smell the tang of the raw spirits that splashed out. All right. So, again, this shows the bear is a bit um, threatening, a bit aggressive, rude. Other characterizations of him. Those are part of his actions. After swallowing several times, the bear put the jar down and turned back to gnaw his haunch of meat, heedless of Farter Quorum and Lyra. 
it seemed, but then he spoke again. What work are you offering? Fighting in all probability, said Fartercorum. We're moving north until we find a place where they've taken some children captive. When we find it, we'll have to fight to get the children free, and then we'll bring them back. And what will you pay? I don't know what to offer you, Irick Burnison. Is gold, if gold is desire, desirable to you, we have gold. No good. What do they pay you at the sledge depot? My keep here in meat and spirits. Silence from the bear, and then he dropped the ragged bone and lifted the jar to his muzzle again, drinking the powerful spirits like water. Forgive me for asking, Iorek uh, Bernison, said Vardarquorum, but you could live a free, proud life on the ice hunting seals and walruses, or you could go to war and win great prizes. What ties you to the troll sun and Ein Arson's bar? Lyra felt her skin shiver all over. She would have thought a question like that, which was almost an insult, would enrage the great creature beyond reason. And she wondered at Farter, want, wondered at Farter Quorum's courage in asking it. Iorik Bernison put down his jar and came close to the gate to peer at the old man's face. Farter Quorum didn't flinch. So Farter Quorum is very brave. It's a characteristic. I know the people you are seeking, the child cutters, the bear said. They left town the day before yesterday to go north with more children. No one will tell you about them. They pretend not to see because the child cutters bring money and business. Now, I don't like the child cutters, so I shall answer you politely. I stay here and drink spirits because the men here took my armor away, and without that, I can hunt seals, but I can't go to war. And I am an armored bear. War is the sea I swim in and the air I breathe. The men of the town gave me spirits and let me drink till I was asleep, and then they took my armor away from me. If I knew where they keep it, I would tear down the town to get it back. If you want my service, the price is this. Get me back my armor. Do that, and I shall serve you in your campaign, either until I am dead or until you have a victory. The price is my armor. I want it back, and then I shall never need spirits again. So a characterization for Eirik the bear. Um, he's very blunt straightforward if you didn't pick up what was just said he's pretty much saying i can't do the things bears do naturally because my armor has been stolen they got me drunk and i'm kind of just stuck here so yeah if you get my armor back i'll work with you otherwise leave me alone so in the next chapter we're going to get some armor for the bear all right so what you should be doing now you should be going back to this passage and finding characteristics of uh, lyra fartercorum or even iric any of those three is fine, and you can fill out your graphic organizer in the email I sent.